So good afternoon and good evening. I'm Alon Confino. I am the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies at UMass. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to another um, meeting, uh, encounter of the Encounters series, which is done uh, by my institute and by the institute directed by Amos Goldberg, the Harman Research Institute for Contemporary Jewelry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. This year, our theme is aftermath. And after he hearing last time about uh, Jewish pogroms after the First World War, discussing it with uh, Jeffrey Weidlinger, uh, we have the pleasure and the honor of having today Ronnie Michel Arielli, and we are going to discuss with her her new book, Remembering the Holocaust in a Racial State, Holocaust Memory in South Africa from Apartheid to Democracy, 1948 to 1994. Just before we begin, a few housekeeping issues. Um, this event is being recorded, and you can also then watch it on the YouTube channel of the Institute. You are most welcome to visit the Institute's Facebook and to join our uh, list if you wish. You can uh, write in the chat to Paz, who is monitoring the, the chat. Um, after our conversation, which will last about 45 minutes, we'll have time for Q&A. Please write your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom, not in the chat. I'd like also to point out our next event in the Encounter series. It's going to take place on Wednesday, November 30th. And this will be a conversation with Hilik Weizmann about his book, Unsettled Heritage, Living Next to Poland's Memorial Jewish Traces After the Holocaust. So I'm uh, delighted to give now the word to Amos Goldberg. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Alon. Do you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much, Alon, and uh, welcome everybody. And indeed, we are delighted to uh, have uh, Dr. Oni Mikel Arielli, who is a cultural historian interested in the intersection between Holocaust memory, contemporary Jewish history, and African studies, which is a very interesting and unique combination. He is uh, the academic director of all history division at the Institute of Contemporary Jewry, and she is also a postdoctoral fellow at the Abraham Harman Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University uh, of Jerusalem, with the support of the Foundation um, for Le Memoir de la Shoah. Uh, her book, titled, as we just heard, Remembering the Holocaust uh, in a Racial State Holocaust Memory in South Africa from Apartheid to Democracy, was recently published in the summer of 2022 uh, in the Greuther series, uh, New Perspectives on Modern Jewish History. She's published uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, articles on her topics and uh, she's now uh, 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 working on two book projects. But we will, uh, of course, talk about her recent book, which uh, as I said, just came out and is extremely interesting because it is uh, uh, as, as the book title goes, uh, Remembering the Holocaust, which is, of course, a, one of the most horrific racial events in the 20th century in a state that maintained racial rules in the apartheid. So the, my first question to you, uh, Oni, as we always do, please give us you know, a very brief introduction. What is this, uh, what is this uh, book about? Uh, and you called it, remember, uh, as we said, Holocaust in racial histories. Can you just a little bit explain to us uh, why this title? Why did, why did you aim? What did you aim at? What did you want uh, readers to understand? And um, what is, you know, all, all, what is so interesting in South Africa in memory, in Holocaust memory, right after the war? Where, uh, we have uh, a, 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 an old a Jewish a, a, a community and now coming some, a, a, mostly from Lithuania, some coming from a, after refugees after the Holocaust. So give us an introduction to this whole big theme that I, I just mentioned. 
Thank you, Amos, for the very kind uh, introduction. And I, I would actually like to take one moment, moment to thank Professor Am Amos Goldberg and Professor Alan Confino for their kind invitation and for providing this amazing platform for me uh, for an open discussion on uh, my book. And I would also like to thank uh, Paz Goldstein for his hard work behind the scene. Uh, and and a last thank you. Uh, so uh, I, I think that you know I, I wrote the book based on my PhD dissertation written under the so very professional and uh, supportive supervision of Professor Liz Bethlehem and Professor Amos Goldberg. So uh, this is an opportunity to thank both of them. And now to your question. Uh, so the title of, of, of my book was actually born out of a conversation I had with a South African activist and artist in 2010, before I even knew that I will write my PhD dissertation on South Africa. Uh, I received the Bertie Labneau Award for Social Justice, uh, Justice and Bertie was uh, a Jewish South African uh, philanthropist. And his daughter, Sue, who was an active in the African National Congress during the 80s, told me about her experiences learning about the Holocaust in high school during the apartheid years. And uh, I realized at that moment that this is something that I need to investigate more. Uh, but actually, only after doing some very intense field work in South Africa, I came up with some additional incentives for this title. So I think the first reason for uh, the title, Remembering the Holocaust in a Racial State, it, it has to do with uh, timing. Apartheid was uh, a system that uh, uh, legalized racism. It was officially introduced in South Africa on May <clears throat> uh, 1948, three years after the end of the Second World War and only nine days after the Israeli Declaration of Independence. And uh, actually, six months later, as we all know, representatives of the world nations uh, convened uh, in Paris and ratified two historic milestone documents, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, and the Universal Declaration, Declaration for Human Rights. Of course, South Africa did not adopt the Genocide Convention, convention nor did it sign the uh, Human Rights Declaration to do, due to its potential to disrupt its practice of uh, racial uh, discrimination. And instead, the new nationalistic government uh, moved to in intensify a pre-existing racial segregation, while at the same time, the local Jewish community, what I refer to in my book as a minority within the privileged white minority, was already very much invested in commemorating the Jewish tragic uh, uh, genocide uh, in the public uh, South African sphere. And this was, I think, a distinctive paradox for me. Um, the second reason is actually something that uh, I thought to be so very unique and even mind-blowing. The fact that after 1948, anti-Semitism was perceived in South Africa, not only by Jews, as a separate phenomenon that uh, had nothing to do with racism. Now, historically, the rise of Nazism in Germany over the 30s inspired an increase in uh, anti-Semitism in South Africa. And there were actually direct links between uh, national party members and other uh, uh, fascist movements in South Africa and the Nazi party in Germany. So the official Jewish community perceived uh, Nazi-inspired anti-Semitism uh, as completely different from the local racism against Blacks, uh, Indians and the colored communities and restricted its activities only to the anti-Semitic aspect of Afrikaner uh, politics. And while in 1948, local anti-Semitism was in decline, the recent memories of the, the pro-Nazi and of course anti-Semitic manifestations in South African public sphere also dictated a Jewish need to uh, represent 
an anti-anti-Semitic message to the white minority. Uh, and therefore, during the apartheid years, one can see how the organized uh, South African Jewry mobilized the lessons of the Holocaust uh, uh, into uh, the fight against local anti-Semitism. However, they perceived these lessons as particular to the Jewish community and did not frame them uh, as universal concerns that might underline anti-racism in the apartheid context. So uh, if I can just uh, conclude this point, I think that in my book, I'm actually using the prism of Holocaust memory to explore South African society as an arena of conflict between the interest of uh, and identities of uh, different uh, uh, social groups and the wide range of attitudes towards Nazism and the Jewish genocide um, uh, among different sectors in the South African commun uh, communities are not simply responsive to the historical event of the Holocaust. Instead, they are a function of the distinct identities uh, at play in each of these sector, sectors and a reflection of their positions within the social and political hierarchy uh, in apartheid South Africa. Um, so, uh, well, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that Holocaust memory uh, was uh, present uh, in anti-racist politics in South Africa by way of analogy uh, is true, but it existed uh, mainly on the margins of South African public discourse. Uh, 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 however, uh, uh, um, as I, I hope that I was able to demonstrate throughout the book, Holocaust memory served first and foremost as a central collective memory for the Jewish community of the country. You're muted, Amos. Oni, let me ask you a question that gets deeper into the, the place culturally and socially of the Jews in post-apartheid South Africa, especially in the first years after uh, 1945 and 1948, the um, uh, institution of- You, you mean apartheid, not post-apartheid? Yes, apartheid, yeah. Post uh, Second World War, yes. In, in the years immediately after the war and after the beginning of apartheid. So what are the Jews according to themselves and according to Afrikaners and also according to blacks? Are they white? Are they kind of white? Well, they're certainly not blacks. Are they in between, like colored? Why is it that antisemitism is not regarded as as a form of, of racism. Um, and, and how, what are the relation, maybe commingling between antisemitism on the one hand, because a lot of the Afrikaners were antisemites, the, the ruling elites, and somehow a certain openness to the Jews to differentiate them from the blacks. So can you tell us more about this? Sure, thanks, uh, Alon. It's, it's actually a very important uh, question. Uh, I think that uh, even before 1948, when institutional racial segregation had been a uh, governmental policy, Jews did not automatically fit into the European and white social and legal frameworks. And, and uh, however, they were also not completely marginalized as non-Europeans, colored or black. And this ambivalent racial in between us produced anxieties about uh, Jewish racial status and belonging within the white regime. Of course, uh, particularly after uh, the, the anti-Semitic manifestation of the 30s and the 40s by Afrikaner uh, um, right-wing uh, activists and politicians. Uh, uh, and the fact that uh, 
uh, anti-Semitism became increasingly common in South Africa during those years. Uh, and Jews living in this racial uh, segregated society were many of the privileged white minority were drawn to uh, those anti-Semitic uh, ideologies. Uh, uh, and it, it happened at the same time that this very community still mourns uh, the, tra the ongoing tragedy uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, where their uh, their relatives are killed. So uh, this whole situation, at the moment of 1948, is really, really uh, a tenuous situation, one that would evolve throughout the apartheid years. Uh, however, I think that it is really crucial to understand that the apartheid era whiteness of South African Jews uh, placed them in a much war, more powerful position than other minorities that belong to their black, Indian, and colored communities. Uh, they were a, a, a minority, but they were a white minority. So they were a minority within the privileged white uh, society and the South African Jewish community was vulnerable in some sense, but it was also uh, uh, very much self-organized and economically integrated. And I try to to uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, uh, this privilege uh, through uh, the, explore, the exploration of the uh, work of memory making in the public sphere. Uh, that the community uh, pursued, and it enabled the community to invest, of course, in relief work during the, uh, the war uh, period and well into the post-war period. And uh, during the post-war period, it also maintained, uh, of course, the community maintained a vital, a vital interest in commemorating the tragedy of a European Jewry in the South African public sphere. So in many ways, the new regime of 1948 marked the establishment of uh, a homogeneous identity and culture for South African Jewry in the face of a reality of increasing institutional racial segregation. So in a country where cultural segregation between all social groups became institutionalized, apartheid separate development party encouraged the Jews uh, like every other ethnic group in the country uh, to invest uh, in the construction of a distinct uh, ethnic uh, identity. And uh, this separation was reflected not only uh, in uh, community uh, institutions, schools, synagogues, and cultural centers, but also in the community's uh, mnemonic practices. So in many ways, uh, throughout this book, uh, I am using Holocaust memory as the lens through which I examine the Jewish community accommodation and assimilation into the white hegemonic uh, minority. Uh, but uh, but uh, Jews were white, and as uh, um, the white uh, were, were a minority, Afrikaner needed all the white that they could get. So uh, of course uh, they became whiter uh, once uh, apartheid uh, was established. Um, and uh, but I need to to stress it doesn't mean that uh, 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 anti-Semitism disappeared from South African public uh, sphere discourse, but it was uh, much more in the margins, uh, and of course uh, uh, not. Uh, uh, similar to the anti-Semitic manifestations of the 30s and the 40s. Thank you, Ruth. Um, first of all, if you can tell us a little bit about the how big is the community, how many survivors come, and, and just give us a you know basic data that we we know about. Uh, but you, you put special emphasis on in the at least in the first chapters on monuments, and especially one monument that, if I remember correctly, you say it's the first monument outside of Europe, not on the European soil, that was established to to commemorate the Holocaust victims. So, how do you explain it? How you know not a very big and uh, 
you know, not the biggest uh, community, Jewish community, and all of a sudden it emerges very, very soon after the war. And you also describe very interestingly that part of what you already mentioned, that it is a kind of a deal between the regime and the Jewish community in a kind of a, to, uh, a, 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 a you, this whole monument is such a is such a interesting story. So, can you tell us about really how this came about? Why is it so early? What is the story of the monument, and why do you perceive it as so important in the uh, in the context you just uh, laid out? Sure. So I, I will start with a short description of the community. So the Jewish community in South Africa. Uh, uh, was established when, uh, in early 19th century, British Jews uh, arrived uh, in the Union and then uh, were followed by uh, several waves of uh, uh, Jewish immigration, mainly from Eastern Europe, Lithuania. Uh, uh, there was a very short uh, period of time where uh, around 3,500 uh, 3, uh, refugees from Germany uh, were able to enter South Africa before the Quota Act was uh, uh, established and uh, uh, South Africa actually closes gates uh, uh, for South Africa, uh, for, for, uh, actually for European Jews. Uh, and uh, so there were not many Holocaust survivors. Most of the Holocaust survivors arrived uh, after the war uh, from other places in uh, the southern hemisphere, uh, that uh, were they were able to flee uh, to during the war. Uh, um, so, and I think that this is on also a, a very a unique uh, issue. Uh, so, there are uh, survivors in South Africa. Uh, but not many. It's not a society of survivors, but still Holocaust memory plays uh, a very central part in the community's identity. And I think that the chapter about the monuments uh, uh, de demonstrates exactly that, how Holocaust memory, memory commemoration, memorialization in South Africa was a central part of the Jewish community's collective identity. And um, I think that uh, uh, what's important to, to stress is that we're not uh, talking about one monument, but rather about four different monuments that were erected during the first decade of apartheid, two in Johannesburg, one in Cape Town, one in uh, Durban, uh, which in itself is uh, very unique for a community that had at that time very few survivors and that had mainly indirect links to the actual events uh, commemorated. And uh, uh, I will explain in a moment, but before uh, uh, trying to look at what Amos described as a community, uh, a non-European community that commemorates the Holocaust. Um, uh, in, in my book, I'm focusing on uh, the two monuments erected in, in Johannesburg as in both cases, while the act was a communal one, there were efforts to engage the non-Jewish white society with the mon monument and its message. And one indication uh, for my claim is that in both cases, the monuments were uh, escorted with inscriptions in Hebrew, English, and Afrikaans. Uh, uh, the second one also included the wording in Yiddish. And the reason for including modern Hebrew inscriptions is clear of course, it was the official language of the state of Israel and was used for prayers. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and of course the use of the English inscriptions also reflected the use of English as the spoken language of most of the members of the Jewish community. Uh, however, the use of uh, Afrikaans here uh, points to uh, communities recognition of the status of the language of Afrikaans as one of the official languages of the country. And those inscriptions would reflect the audience uh, for which uh, the monument was uh, actually intended, uh, indicating that although it was a Jewish symbolic commemorative status, it was also directed at the country's white community as a whole. 
And another important point here is uh, that I actually offer to read or interpret the establishment of the monuments as a du duplication of the apartheid culture of memorialization within Afrikaner nationalism. And I refer here to the Great Trek Monument, uh, one of the greatest Afrikaner uh, commemorative efforts of the 20th century that was erected in 1949 to commemorate the epic of the Great Trek of 1836. Uh, this is a, 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 a tremendous, a very central event in uh, Afrikaner nationalism. And in a country where uh, the white hegemonic minority invested tremendous research in constructing uh, its national identity through monuments, the local Jewish community sought to embrace a similar a memorial a strategy within the, uh, of course, the accepted boundaries of apartheid policy. And uh, so, as I said, uh, it's really important to, uh, uh, to stress that uh, not only uh, this is not only uh, an example for the ways in which the official Jewish community conveyed its anti-anti-Semitic message to the white public, but also because uh, compared to other Jewish communities outside of Europe during these years, as Amos mentioned, this was a unique and outstanding act of memorialization. So there was actually no status or marker on public spaces uh, erected in cities with substantial and influential Jewish communities outside of Europe uh, during the first decade of uh, following the war. Uh, and although Jewish communities in Europe, of course, built uh, memorials to commemorate uh, uh, the killing sites, uh, um, um, uh, it was not uh, the case uh, in other uh, communities outside of Europe. Europe. And um, uh, therefore, I, I, I thought that uh, this is a very, very unique uh, uh, way of commemorating uh, and, and this kind of event. So, um, uh, of course, we have Yad Vashem in Jerusalem at a time which was officially uh, declared as an Israeli national monument in 1953. And, uh, uh, it was, but but it was different because, uh, 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 despite being geographically distant uh, from the atrocities, uh, Israel, uh, from its uh, establishment, positioned itself as the spiritual and uh, practical representative of all Holocaust victims, uh, and and. And, and also Israel had no, uh, did not have uh, a Jewish minority. Uh, uh, so I, I think that uh, compared to other Jewish communities in the world, it was a very, uh, a very unique uh, act. Ronnie, so I'd like to follow up on this and to ask you whether there are any debates in the Jewish community, not about commemorating the Holocaust, I assume that Jews wanted to commemorate the Holocaust, but whether it is politically uh, feasible and uh, whether it is expedient um, to commemorate the Holocaust, which is a non-South African event, which draws attention to the Jewish community, um, which... Um, um, yeah. Um, and and why is it that Afrikaner went along with it? Is it because, as you said before, they needed all the whites that they that they can get? So, because I can see uh, uh, Afrikaner also say, well, you should admire the great track, but leave the Holocaust aside. This is not our, I mean, the late 40s, beginning of the 50s, these are not the days of global Holocaust remembrance in which now we have Holocaust museums in New Zealand and Australia that have nothing to do with the Holocaust. Okay, this, but in 19, immediately after the institution of apartheid, why the Afrikaners go along with it? So I think that it's not only uh, to whiten the, the Jews. Uh, you know, uh, we have world, uh, Cold War politics. 
that are getting into this matrix. And uh, during those years, uh, uh, the, the post war years, uh, uh, the apartheid government needs to, you know, get rid of her fascist image. Uh, uh, the uh, the the pro-fascist, pro-Nazi messages of the 30s and 40s are not acceptable anymore in the world, and uh, not in the East and not in the West. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, when you ask about the government, this is one very important incentive. And, and of course, if you, if you are talking about the, the Jewish community, it is important to say that the, commu the Jewish community in South Africa had, had, and I think still has two pillars. One is Zionism, is the state of Israel, and the other is the Holocaust. Uh, those two issues are main issues uh, that occupy the official Jewish community uh, uh, from, from during the war years and of course through to the establishment of the state of Israel. And uh, the, that's why uh, the relations between, between the apartheid government and the Israeli government were so uh, uh, crucial uh, uh, for, uh, for the Jewish community. Uh, so we have also this point, uh, but I have to say, and I, I also think that Amos mentioned uh, mentioned something like uh, a deal between the the Jews and the apartheid uh, regime, and I I think that I would not refer to the, the this complex relations between the official Jewish community in South Africa and the apartheid regime as an agreement of any sort. Uh, I would definitely not simplify uh, the Jewish position in South Africa as one of total collaboration, nor as one of total resistance. Okay, and it was uh, not a dichotomic situation. Uh, uh, and one needs to understand that the positioning of the Jews in South Africa is not static, uh, but also changed significantly. Uh, uh, across time. And I try to provide the readers with a deeper historization of South African Jewry in order to understand in nuanced ways uh, precisely what uh, connections Jews and indeed other South Africans did or, and didn't see at different historical moments and to understand why they responded in uh, the way they did. Therefore, I uh, would urge us uh, just to, to try and unpack the complexity of the, the, the Jewish reality in, in South Africa during the apartheid years. And I think that the best way uh, I actually found to do it, and, and uh, I think it was only when I finished translating and uh, you know rewriting my dissertation into a book, uh, uh, was through a notion, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, the notion of implicated subjects uh, by uh, Michael Rothberg uh, from his most recent book. And I, I, I try to, to demonstrate throughout the book that, uh, and I, I keep on saying a minority within the, the privileged mi minority, the privileged white minority, but the community was vulnerable. Uh, 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 but it was also economically integrated. So this privilege enabled the community to play its part in both supporting Israel and fighting against local and global anti-Semitism uh, by mobilizing the lessons of the Holocaust. And I agree with you, uh, Alon. Uh, I think that the South African community uh, is, is, is is you can see moves that you can you can find in the Jewish world and the Zionist Jewish world much later, uh, and uh, the Holocaust is being uh, uh, recruited uh, into uh, the you know uh, um, sorry as as you know as a blue word for uh, the Jewish community. Uh, in order to fight against local anti-Semitism, but it's also in order to assimilate into the white society. Um, so do you think, Ronnie, it came to me only now, 
that in some roundabout and ironic way, we can say that Holocaust memory also helped to uh, accommodate apartheid to in, in these years, help to um, internalize it, to make it, um, to make it, what's the word? I'm looking for a, a soft word, uh, to make it um, acceptable or uh, to, to internalize it. Um, no, I, I can't, I can't say that, but I can say that Holocaust, uh, uh, the Holocaust memory became uh, an important tool in uh, accommod accommodating to apartheid, accommodating Jews into the new reality, into the new regime. Is, is a very good word. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, this, is, uh, this is ironic. Also, the word accommodating. Uh, of course. <laughs> leads to ironic historical consequences. Yes. So I want I want us to move now to the black community. And tell us more about about how did the um... Alon, I, I want to ask first. I, I, I want to okay, just a second before we move to the black community. If you can, nobody noticed that there's some kind of discrepancy or even straightforward contradiction in remembering, as you call it, the Holocaust in a racial state within the community or outside the community. Before we move. There is something you understand. No, yeah. the, 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 nobody noticed that there is some something a bit odd, odd. odd ironic, contradictory. So I, I want to. Nobody noticed, <laughs> uh, um, but I think that when I examine uh, the. The you know well if you examine certain individual Jewish activists against apartheid, some will of course point to such such paradox and ironic, uh, you know when uh, Poster uh, visits Yad Vashem in 1976. Uh, Arthur Goldreich, the uh, anti-apartheid activist uh, uh, in Israel, tried to create uh, a protest and to point to the ironic uh, situation where uh, the same pro-Nazi uh, architect of apartheid who stood at the, in Cape Town at the harbor and uh, uh, stopped German refu Jewish refugees from entering the country is the same one that in 1976 will uh, visit uh, Yad Vashem uh, and wash his hands. Uh, so uh, there were people who of course pointed uh, towards uh, this uh, ironic and paradoxical uh, uh, situations. But I think that for the official Jewish community, anti-Semitism was perceived as completely separate from racism. And uh, I think that it's, it's also, uh, the, the part of the story is also, of course, the perception of Holocaust uniqueness. Uh, and 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 you know uh, the I I I I think in in many uh, uh, different moments in the book I uh, provide some insights about uh, you know the uh, Jewish uh, uh, reporters and leaders stating um, uh, you know. Uh, what is happening in the townships is terrible, but this is not Auschwitz and it's not Dachau and it's not Majdanek. Uh, so uh, I think that it is very complex uh, and this irony comes here and there, but this is not the main discourse. This is not, uh, uh, of course, you will find it uh, 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 in the black discourse, uh, 
but uh, I think that only during the transition from apartheid to democracy, when uh, the Anne Frank exhibition in the, uh, 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 comes to, to South Africa and the Anne Frank house in Amsterdam says, well, we will come only under the condition that there will be a, a, another exhibition on apartheid and resistance that will travel together with the Anne Frank exhibition. Only then, that uh, this is the, actually the first time that that the connections are out there, and the Jewish, the official Jewish community is is you know one of the organizers of this national event. So until then, uh, I think that Holocaust uniqueness is a very very uh, distinct and central uh, position uh, that you can find in many reports of the South African Jewish Board of Deputies uh, meetings. and uh, But in the 80s, you can see how little by little the discourse changes inside the community. We'll talk about the 80s, but Alon had a question about the Black uh, community. Yeah, but the, the, the more I hear you, the more I see, of course, but also Holocaust uniqueness is a certain a positioning of yourself, confronting history, confronting yourself, confronting the past, the future. Um, the more I hear you, and this was my impression of the book, but I'm a reader. It's, it's, you know, once you write a book, it's out of your hand, Ronnie. No. It's in the hands of the readers. They can even misrepresent your book. <laughs> that, um, There are good historical and emotional reasons to commemorate the Holocaust, but in this specific case, it was used actually to, uh, um, to privilege the Jews and their experience within the whites, obviously within uh, confronting the blacks, and to uh, accommodate, to give a, a justification of why we can go along with this, uh, with this regime among other things. So okay. tell us more about the Blacks, the, um, the liberation movement of the Blacks to the Holocaust in general, to the commemoration of the Holocaust. Uh, was Holocaust memory important for this uh, community, uh, to the, for, the, for the ANC, for the Jews who were part of the liberation movement? How did they see uh, their, their Jewish community who accommodated and Holocaust remembrance? Okay, so I'll start by saying that when I first came to South Africa in 2014, uh, uh, I arrived to the archives and uh, when I came back, I went through thousands of, uh, of scanned material and I realized that, well, uh, there is all, uh, there is still apartheid in the archives, so you can only find the voices of the, of the of course the Jewish community and the white society. Um, and I remember struggling with it, but then I read an article of Shirley Gilbert where she wrote about the symbol of Anne Frank. Uh, in South Africa, and she opened the article with um, uh, a sentence on uh, uh, an Indian uh, South African activist, Ahmed Katrada, who read the diary of Anne Frank on Robben Island and copied parts of it. And I, I, I felt like, okay, here there is a lead. Uh, and a few months later, I went to Robben Island to the archives in Western Cape University, and I located those notebooks, and I found 13 quotations from the diary of Anne Frank. But that's it, that's what I had. I had this and I had a memoir. Uh, and, uh, and then 
two years later, I was lucky enough to, to see that Ahmed Katrada was uh, participated in uh, a, an event of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And I turned to the amazing Tali Nates, the director of the center, and, and told her, well, Tali, you really need to convince him to give me an interview. And a month later, we met in Johannesburg in his apartment. Uh, and this was a very, very uh, important meeting for me. Uh, he died six months later. And, uh, and during that meeting, he gave me permission to go through his private archive. Uh, and I must say, it was through uh, uh, Louise Bethlehem's uh, uh, European Research Council project, apartheid, the uh, anti-apartheid, the, the global itinerary, uh, that I was able to trace uh, uh, Ahmed Katrada's uh, uh, um, uh, life story with relations to uh, Holocaust memory and what was the role of Holocaust memory in his struggle. Uh, I tracked him through, uh, through his path from uh, a visit he made uh, to Warsaw in 1951 and then to Auschwitz when he actually picked uh, 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 some human bones from the uh, who happened to be there uh, outside of the incinerators, and he took it uh, with him back to South Africa and used it in his political speeches as a material display uh, of the conscious uh, the consequences of racism. Uh, so, and then uh, after he died, I was able uh, to get the perm permission to go through his private uh, uh, archive, and I actually located police uh, reports, the secret police reports. They were uh, uh, following him, of course, uh, and uh, uh, transcripting every uh, speech that he made during the 50s. And I could find those speeches where he used the battle of bones uh, and and telling the story about uh, the Warsaw Ghetto and about the Auschwitz and about the Jews. And uh, uh, this was for me uh, a way to uh, engage not only with the white perceptions. Uh, uh, so of course, during the, the, the post-war period, the direct and analogical connections between right-wing Afrikaners and Nazi and fascist ideologies drove many activists who opposed the racial uh, uh, segregation policies of the union to point to parallel policies uh, of racial discrimination between the South African and Nazi regimes. Uh, and uh, their anti-fascist language combined actually global concepts heavily borrowed from the, the, the struggle against fascism and Nazism in Europe uh, in the 30s and 40s, uh, but with also the colonial and racialist realities in South Africa. And by doing so, activists contested uh, the alleged uniqueness of conditions in South Africa. Uh, and uh, at the same time, they gave anti-Nazism new meaning and drew practices, uh, practical lessons from it. Uh, uh, so I could find uh, political speeches, political uh, reports, uh, articles from uh, the early post-war years of uh, various sections of the anti-apartheid movement. And, and, and also one needs to remember that the anti-apartheid movement was not a homogenic one. You had liberal uh, activists and you had uh, communist uh, activists and uh, you, you cannot really uh, 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 compare uh, uh, or, or you know uh, uh, address this uh, as a whole as a homogenic entity. Uh, so we can point to different ways of addressing the Holocaust and uh, analogical connection to apartheid throughout the realm of South African political left. Uh, but I, I, what I did in my book was only to provide the logic context of the use of the analogy, the Nazi analogy in anti-apartheid activism 
uh, in uh, uh, from the 40s to the 80s. And then I moved to uh, explore two very different attitudes towards Holocaust memory in relation to the struggle against apartheid. And the one was the one that I told you about the Muslim Indian South African anti-apartheid uh, activist, uh, Ahmed Katwara. And uh, the other is of the uh, anti-apartheid activist and uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, uh, laureate uh, Archbishop Desmond Mafilu Tutu. Both of them, uh, unfortunately, uh, died during uh, or after uh, uh, I uh, worked on my book. Uh, so I'm trying to be very careful not to generalize. Uh, I cannot argue that Holocaust memory served as a powerful weapon or uh, for all anti-apartheid activists, uh, no matter what their political positioning was. And I I, I can also, uh, I, I, I don't feel that I can also argue that it was uh, the main tool or point of reference or inspiring theme uh, in the struggle. Nevertheless, uh, we do have uh, indications uh, that the Holocaust uh, 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 was an uh, inspiring event. Uh, uh, while, well, of course, most of this evidence are uh, in retrospect, like Nelson Mandela and Govan Becky's uh, uh, addresses at the Anne Frank in the wall exhibition that I mentioned earlier from the uh, transition from apartheid to democracy. So they spoke uh, 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 about the reading of the diary of Anne Frank on Robben Island. And of, of course it was made uh, in retrospect uh, and uh, one needs to say paved the way for the memory of the Holocaust to become part of the new South African consent memory. Uh, uh, and uh, of course the the Caprada case uh, uh, gave me the opportunity to, to provide a more contemporary evidence. Uh, among other things, uh, uh, as I said, I had the prison notebook. I had uh, an interview with him, of course, from 2016, but I also had the, po the political speeches from the 50s and his own memoirs. So, uh, but it was his own life story and not a total reflection of the struggle. Uh, and as, as for the Jews, I can't hear you alone. You are. Let's muted. stop here because we okay. have a lot of questions. Okay. We want to get to some of them. So sure. Amos, you you go next, and uh, then I'll go. Uh, okay. So really, there are a lot of questions in the Q and A. We will not be able to address all of them, but I want to ask you, Nomi Taubes, uh, uh, and I would perhaps even uh, 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 um, will uh, follow up on. Her question, and really, do you discuss uh, Foster's 1976 visit to Yad Vashem in the book? And if so, how? How do you think the ideological relationship between Israel and apartheid South Africa balanced with or against the more plainly real politic elements of the alliance? And 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 I would even uh, expand this a little bit and say, uh, how did this this uh, relationship affect? Or impact the Jewish community, the fight against anti-Semitism and, and, and Holocaust memory? Okay, thank you. It is a very, very important question. Uh, of course, I do address Forster's uh, uh, visit to Yad Vashem uh, uh, when I'm uh, uh, when, when I'm providing the uh, historical background for uh, uh, the 70s uh, decade. Uh, but I think that uh, this is also uh, very, very complex uh, as the relations between Israel and South Africa are also not static and evolve throughout time. And as I said, so the South African Jewish community was always very Zionist uh, in general. Uh, therefore, it had played its part uh, um, uh, contributing to the establishment of the state of Israel, which was actually welcomed by most of the South African public. 
Uh, and we know that uh, in uh, 1953 in Milan, Daniel Milan, uh, the first apartheid uh, prime minister visited Israel and he was the first head of government to visit the state of Israel. Uh, uh, but but yes, uh, uh, during the the the, the 60s, uh, we see how uh, uh, Israeli Israel's anti-apartheid votes at the UN, uh, particularly following the Shavuot massacre of March 1960, uh, as well as its expansion of bilateral uh, diplomatic relations with decolonized African uh, states brought about an increase in local manifestations of anti-Semitism and repeated accusations of actual dual loyalty against the Jewish community. But, uh, and we will get to uh, Naomi's uh, 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 time period in question, I, I think that the Six Day War proves to be a turning point in restoring good diplomatic relations between Israel and South Africa, and a new bond uh, 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 was shaped uh, largely by this mutual self-perception of the two countries within a framework of World War uh, politics. And this mutual uh, uh, perception commonly referred to as the uh, common lot par uh, paradigm, uh, intentionally drew similarities uh, between the two countries' struggle for existence at home, uh, uh, as well as the, in the international arena, the UN. And interestingly, uh, on the one hand, we have the apartheid government and the Israeli one pointing to the, uh, 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 to, to the similarities between the two countries. However, at the same time, uh, the same similarities are interpreted uh, quite differently at the UN, as well as in uh, uh, leftist circles in South Africa and beyond it. So the alliance between South Africa and Israel becomes a source for criticism in anti-apartheid uh, circles and serves as a strong base for public discussion about the similarities between the two countries' racial policies, uh, especially following the affirmation of the UN 1973 Apartheid Convention on the one hand, and the, uh, of course, Resolution 3379 in November uh, uh, 1975. So uh, I think that... Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, that, that's fine. Yeah. You, okay. you said it. Very Thank good. <laughs> so... Ronnie, we, we have a, a question slash comment from Stephen Klingman, who is a professor for English literature at UMass. And he says uh, he would like to emphasize the importance of historicization. It's my impression, having grown up in South Africa, that Holocaust memory was privatized, i.e. private memory rather than public, especially early on. I'm not sure how much can be judged from official documents. The early monuments seem to be at least potentially tactical on all sides, a vulnerable Jewish community negotiating its way between victimhood and aligning itself at the same time with a new regime. It's worth saying that there was a third pillar in the Jewish community, which you mentioned briefly, that is active resistance in the liberation movements where Jewish individuals were prominent. Official Ju Judaism worked a much more cautious line. Later, of course, there were alliances between South Africa and Israel. So I was wondering if you, if you want to um, comment on that. Yeah, so... Um... It's it's a very long but interesting uh, comment, and uh, I thank you for it. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, I'm basing uh, most of my uh, book material on official documents of the community, and uh, uh, and what I tried to do uh, was uh, to to find dominant themes in each uh, period uh, and, and through uh, those uh, different acts of commemoration of or discursive per performances of Holocaust memory in each period uh, to 
speak about uh, uh, the, the Jewish uh, efforts to accommodate to apartheid. Uh, so uh, I agree that there were uh, uh, private initiatives. Uh, I think that there were uh, also uh, uh, many public efforts to commemorate uh, the Holocaust uh, uh, in the community. And, as for, and, and I actually, of course, invite you to read the book and, and to see, uh, I have a whole chapter on uh, the ways in which uh, the community, the, the official community organizations uh, uh, um, uh, fight against Holocaust denial through apartheid censorship system on the one hand, and encourage Holocaust different images, uh, uh, theatrical, uh, television, uh, or, or cinematic images of the Holocaust through the same uh, system. Uh, so uh, uh, that's about the private versus uh, the public. Uh, and about the third pillar. So uh, I will not uh, argue with you. I think that of course there were many individuals uh, among the Jewish community that were active, but, uh, and, and, and we can also say of course that among the white activists against apartheid, many of them were Jews, but they were a neglected percentage of the community. And one cannot say that during the apartheid years, they were a very central pillar of the official Jewish community. Uh, they were a source of anxiety at many points. Um, I hope I, I answered. I think we will have time for two more questions or so because uh, we usually uh, do it uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so one question that uh, you already started referring to and uh, comes also in the Q&A, what, what is the situation in the post-apartheid in South Africa? How, how, how Holocaust, I mean, we know that there are quite a lot of institutions. There is a very big institution, a very unique one in Johannesburg. So, but Broadly speaking, what is the what is the place of Holocaust memory in Jewish infant communities after uh, in the post-apartheid up till now? So I think that, uh, so I I mentioned the Anne Frank uh, in the World Exhibition uh, that I think was very crucial in uh, uh, creating. Uh, uh, or, or providing a, a, a national space uh, officially for a comparison between uh, Nazism and, the, and apartheid, the Holocaust and, and apartheid, because until then, uh, uh, any comparison made between the Holocaust and apartheid was perceived as taboo. And during that period, the universal lessons of the Holocaust were mobilized in the framework of this national project. And the Holocaust was uh, instated as the paradigm of a traumatic historical past, while the traumas of apartheid were still being enacted in the present. And uh, this positioning uh, invited, I think, an awareness of the historical similarities between two distinct events, the Holocaust and apartheid. Uh, and uh, um, what we can see after was in 1999, we have uh, the first uh, Holocaust center uh, in Cape Town uh, that was open. We actually have now three Holocaust and genocide centers, all became Holocaust and genocide. Uh, and in, in 2007, in response to uh, a decision by the National Department of Education in South Africa to include the history of the Holocaust in the national curriculum of both na uh, grade nine and 11, the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation was established as this umbrella org organization to provide actually a national home for the field of Holocaust and Genocide education and to uh, uh, train the teachers uh, 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 to teach about the Holocaust. So, uh, and in fact, students in South Africa are learning about the Holocaust first, 
and uh, only then about apartheid. And it is in order uh, that the students will be better occupied to make connections to their own situation and to current issues, including human, human rights abuses in South Africa, xenophobia, and uh, of course, uh, also throughout the, the, uh, the African continent. So I think that we, we see kind of a mirror uh, picture uh, it's 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 quite the opposite from what we saw during the apartheid years. Um, uh, the centers are very very active, uh, and uh, we're actually even very very active and very. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, they have to be very very uh, initiate. You know, they, they have to initi initiate. Uh, uh, pro uh, special programs during COVID uh, in order to get into places that had no internet. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, uh, this is uh, an optimistic way of uh, uh, maybe addressing uh, what is happening now. Oni, we'd like to uh, close with a final question by uh, Jonathan Skolnik, who is a professor at, uh, for German studies at UMass. And he asks about a non-Jewish white Holocaust memory in South Africa, given that there were South African troops fighting against the Nazis as part of the British Empire. So did they bring with them after 45 um, Holocaust remembrance or remembrance of the extermination of the Jews? And did this memory shape in any way um, 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 South Africans' memory of the Holocaust after the war and after the beginning of apartheid? Were there any relations between them and the Jewish community? Wow, this is a whole new direction. Um, so, of course, we know that many uh, white South Africans served in, in uh, the military uh, during the World War II, uh, and also 10% of the Jewish community in South Africa were uh, recruited, volunteered. Uh, uh, so we do have uh, uh, not, uh, I, I didn't uh, run into recollections or, or, or discussions uh, about uh, uh, European uh, camps. Uh, only uh, Italian ones, but not the German ones. Uh, but, you know, uh, I may have missed, uh, uh, and, and it's an, actually a very interesting direction to maybe think of expanding this. Um, so, Alon, do you want to, to close the, or we will ask one more question? Uh, no, I think we can close before people will start to leave because they have other things to do. It was excellent. It was fascinating, Ronnie. We recommend everyone to look at this book. Uh, thank you for the lively discussion. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> thank you all for coming, really. Well done. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.